Hey guys, this is the final uh, fifth installment of this series on photosynthesis and the biochemistry of photosynthesis. And now we're going to get down to the nuts and bolts of the Calvin cycle, sometimes called the dark reaction. Not because they necessarily take place in the dark, but because they don't need light. Um, once the light reactions have taken place and supplied all the ATP and NADPH that's needed, then the Calvin cycle can go ahead and start building uh, organic matter from CO2. So let's take a look at how this happens. <clears throat> this figure here I've mentioned before, you really ought to learn this one well. Um, camp out on this. Make sure this, this big picture makes sense to you of what's happening both in the light reactions and the dark reactions. So we saw in the light reactions that really as long as water is available, the energy from light <clears throat> can be used by photosystems 1 and 2 to generate ATP and NADPH that are necessary for the Calvin cycle. So what we want to see now is how does the Calvin cycle then take this carbon dioxide using the energy from ATP and the high energy electrons from NADPH to produce sugars. That's really what we're after understanding here. Now the Calvin cycle, the overall chemical reaction, it looks kind of complicated, but it's not too bad when you break it down. So slow down and take a look at this. We're going to take three carbon dioxide molecules and we're going to convert them into something called a glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Now you're often taught that the Calvin cycle or photosynthesis produces glucose and it in a sense does, but more directly it produces glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And if you've recently studied cell respiration, you, you might be wondering, wait a minute, where have I heard glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate before? That's a key intermediate halfway through glycolysis when we're breaking down glucose. So glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is a great little precursor for biosynthesis. And it's, it's very easy for the plant then to take two G3Ps and snap them together. Uh, with a dehydration synthesis reaction and make a glucose molecule. So in a sense, we are making glucose, and starch and cellulose are made primarily from glucose. We are making glucose essentially, but it's really G3P that's being directly made. <clears throat> now to take three carbon dioxides and make a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule takes some energy. And that energy is going to come in the form of nine ATPs and some electrons as well in the form of six NADPHs. Now, if you notice here, we're going to be using, consuming our ATP in a 3 to 2 ratio relative to our NADPH. So we're going to be using half again as much ATP as NADPH, thus necessitating uh, a cyclic electron flow possibility in the light reactions. If that's not making sense, go back to the, the non-cyclic and cyclic electron flow videos that preceded this one and make sure that makes sense to you. And then the used up versions of ATP and NADPH, which would be ADP and phosphate and NADP plus, are both going to get recycled and become available for more rounds of the, uh, the light reactions. So in summary, it's fair to say that the Calvin cycle uses ATP and NADPH to convert CO2 into sugar. That's kind of a nice, succinct statement for what the Calvin cycle is all about. But as you guys know by now, this little arrow right here is deceptive. Uh, it hides countless reactions. For my students uh, that are you know, first year bio majors, I don't require you to know all the enzymes involved. There's one key enzyme that I'm going to have you learn. The rest of them you don't have to know. I don't, you don't have to know all the intermediates. Um, but we are going to zoom in a bit on this arrow and see what that arrow actually represents. We're going to break it into three uh, phases. The first is carbon fixation, which means taking CO2, inorganic carbon, and incorporating it into a pre-existing organic molecule. Then we're going to reduce it. We're going to add electrons from our NADPH and actually reduce those bonds. And then ultimately, we're going to regenerate a carrier molecule, right? This is a, this is a, a cycle, the Calvin cycle. Uh, it's not a linear path like glycolysis. It's more of a cycle like Krebs, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, or citric acid cycle, right? Where in Krebs, if you remember, we've got oxaloacetate that holds onto our two-carbon acetyl group from our original glucose and and sort of escorts it through all the steps. We're going to see that this molecule here, ribulose bisphosphate, it's a five carbon sugar with two phosphates on it, is our carrier of our CO2. And we're going to need to regenerate that carrier so it doesn't get consumed because in the end, if it got consumed, 
this whole process would cost the cell more than it's gaining. And that, uh, that wouldn't make any sense, right? So let's look at each of these three phases in kind of broad strokes. <clears throat> so in the phase one, carbon fixation, we're going to take six carbon dioxides and we're going to attach them to six of these ribulose bisphosphate molecules. And when we do that, we're using one key enzyme called Rubisco. Rubisco is arguably the most abundant protein on the entire planet and arguably the most important enzyme on the entire planet. Without Rubisco, nothing as we know it on planet Earth can function. Ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. What does this enzyme do? It takes these six CO2s and adds each one to one of these five carbon ribulose bisphosphates and then it breaks them apart. So if you add one CO2, let's look at it here. If you add a CO2, and I don't know why they drew the CO2s a little wonky instead of just double bonds on either side, but uh, it's neither here nor there. But you take a CO2, a single carbon, and you add it to this five carbon sugar, ribulose bisphosphate. Ribulose is one, two, three, four, five carbons. The bisphosphate, bis just means two, phosphates on either end. We're going to covalently attach the CO2 to the second carbon, and then we're going to uh, carry out a hydrolytic reaction by inserting water here after carbon number two. And so when we break this bond right here, you see what we end up with. We snap it apart, and we end up with two identical three carbon molecules called 3-phosphoglycerate. Phospho because on third carbon, if, if our carboxyl group is number one, we got one, two, three. Third carbon has a phosphate on it. And glycerate is a three carbon molecule that has a carboxyl group at the end. So we're going to take six carbon dioxides, add them to six RUBPs using one enzyme. We're going to carry out two steps to make 12 of these three phosphoglycerate molecules, three carbons each. If the math isn't making sense, you got six carbons here. You've got 30 carbons here, six five carbon RUBPs. There's 36, and we're going to break them into 12. After combining them, we're going to break them into 12 three carbon molecules. So continued with 36. We can account for all of our carbons in this process. So first step is to take inorganic carbon and attach it to an organic molecule, and we call this carbon fixation. Rubisco is the key enzyme for carbon fixation. In the second phase, we need to reduce the carbon. So 3-phosphoglycerate, A-T-E, could also be called 3-phosphoglyceric acid. If we go back here, it's called glycerate because this third, or in this case, first carbon, is a carboxyl functional group. These do not represent uh, high-energy electrons, right? This is an oxidized form of carbon. It needs to be reduced. So we're going to actually add some high energy electrons to this and reduce this molecule further by converting it from 3-phosphoglycerate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay, So they're both three carbon molecules. They're still based on this glycer backbone of three carbons. They're both still phosphorylated, but we're going from glycerate to glyceraldehyde. Okay, let's go back and look at that again. Glycerate has a carboxyl functional group here. Glyceraldehyde, I don't have a slide for it, but you can picture, we remove this oxygen right here and replace it with a hydrogen. So this becomes an aldehyde. And that carbon to hydrogen bond requires a high energy electron pair. And therefore we are reducing, we're gonna add those electrons from NADPH and we are reducing this literally in the, the electrical sense of adding electrons to the functional group. So step one is carbon fixation, attaching our CO2. Step two <clears throat> is converting our 12 3-phosphoglycerates into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. Now this takes a lot of energy. This is going to require 1 ATP and 1 NADPH for every 3-phosphoglycerate that we, we carry out, that we uh, reduce through this conversion process. Lots of steps, lots of enzymes. My students don't need to know that. Um, just understand the basic principles. Now, having said that, if you're a visual person and it's really helpful for you to see um, the intermediate molecules and all the enzymes carrying out each step, you can find that in your textbook. You can find it online. It's very well established. Just know that if you study that, it's not for the sake of my exams. 
It's for the sake of you understanding how we got from our three phosphoglycerates to our glyceraldehyde three phosphates. Now, so far we're using ATP and NADPH in a one-to-one -one ratio, but we know from earlier conversations that we need more ATP than NADPH. That's going to come in in our final step regeneration, where we regenerate our six RUBP molecules. Remember, these are carriers. We don't want them consumed in the reaction. We want them regenerated so they can continue to carry these CO2s through this whole process. So step one here, Rubisco single complex enzyme does this. Step two, regeneration, that was carbon fixation, uh, sorry, not regeneration, step two, it's a, a reduction in step two. Takes a lot of energy from ATP and a lot of electrons from NADPH. Now we've got this pool of 12 glyceraldehyde three phosphates. <clears throat> we're gonna take 10 of those glyceraldehyde three phosphates and we're going to rearrange them, recombine and rearrange them into six ribulose bisphosphates. Think about that. 10 glyceraldehyde three phosphates, three carbons each, that's 30 carbons. We're gonna recombine and rearrange into six five carbon ribulose bisphosphates, also 30 carbons. Okay, so we, we need to keep track of our math that way. That means, and that takes six more ATP, there's the additional ATP, thus necessitating cyclic electron flow in the light reactions. Down here though, we stole 10 of these 12 in order to get our RUBP carriers back, which means our net yield from all six CO2s originally coming in is two glyceraldehyde three phosphates. And you're thinking, oh, what a ripoff. Let's do the math. Six carbons from CO2, two three carbon glyceraldehydes. Six carbons. And in fact, very easily the cell can take these two, snap them together into a glucose. Six CO2s being converted to to one glucose molecule. That is the Calvin cycle. It's a cycle because we've got a carrier that needs to be regenerated in the process. And the energy in the form of ATP and the high energy electron pairs from NADPH are all yielded ultimately from uh, the light reactions. <clears throat> in fact, if you track the electrons that are now in our glucose molecule, the high energy electron pairs, they're 24 high energy electrons, 12 pairs, all of them originated in water. If that sentence that I just made, that statement doesn't make sense to you, or you can't see how that's justified, spend some time working your way backwards. The electrons necessary to combine all these carbons and hydrogens into, glycer into a, a glucose, really, they all originated in water. How did that happen? figure that out, make sure that makes sense. All right, we just went through a lot in the Calvin cycle. Go back through each of these, make sure each step makes sense. Again, if you need more visuals, like you need to see RUBP laid out again and how it's uh, combined with CO2 to form and then split to form the 12 three phosphoglycerates or in the second set of reactions during reduction, what are the steps or in the regeneration, how did we take 10 of these G3Ps and convert them to six RUBPs? If your brain works in such a way that you need to see all that laid out, go through your book very carefully, one step at a time, and make sure that makes sense to you. I'm going to leave you with this figure at the end of our entire discussion here. Uh, remember, this is a five-video series. You probably shouldn't have started with this video. Hopefully, you started with number one, worked your way through the overviews, then into the two types of light reactions, both cyclic and non-cyclic electron flow, finally finishing here with the Calvin cycle where CO2 is fixed and reduced into sugars in the plants. I hope this has been helpful to you guys. Um, please bring questions to me. We'll make time in class for questions. Don't just say, oh, well, gee, I don't understand. It's for somebody else. If you don't get it, let's figure it out, okay? Um, this is important stuff, and understanding both cell respiration on the one hand and photosynthesis on the other, you've got basically the two most important sets of biochemical reactions for all of life on planet Earth, right? Two reverse reactions. One, one is the reverse of the other and vice versa, right? And ultimately all the energy comes from sunlight, all the electrons come from water, all the carbon comes from CO2 in the entire global cycle for these two processes. Hope this has been helpful. Good luck as you guys study. Look forward to seeing you soon.